thanks everyone for joining the uh, second webinar of the Canadian <laughs> Network. The slides really aren't meant to be a formal presentation, but in a virtual meeting like this, just um, helping to frame our discussion over the next hour. And um, Graham, do you want to go forward too? So if anyone's having IT difficulty, feel free to um, send a chat and Graham will monitor that and, uh, and help you out. Also, if there are any questions that come up that you feel you can't get in during the discussion, feel free to um, put them in as a chat and we'll get to that as well. In terms of attendance, thank you for everyone that's um, given us your name already or put your name down on the participant list. If you haven't, um, please send a quick note to Selena just so we can track who was at the meeting. So today over the next hour, we have a bit of a packed agenda. We're going to uh, talk a bit about recapping the purpose of the network that we um, talked about last time. We will introduce you to, at least virtually, to the steering committee of the network and then go through um, a bit of a uh, recap of the uh, ad agenda we had with that steering committee where we met um, on November 30th. And then we're going to talk a bit um, about working group and next steps for this initiative. But before that, we actually have um, our fortunate to have a guest presenter talking about some national initiatives that are already uh, in the realm of the CKD world that we can hopefully start to disseminate. And then we'll try to set up meetings now at least months and frequency for the next few meetings so we can all get it in our calendar. Um, just as a recap, the first webinar, there is a YouTube um, presentation of it that was taped. There were about 40 people. Many of you were there. It was on July 6th. And I think the key points I got from that is really the enthusiasm for the network, um, but the need for kind of clear agenda structure and deliverables of this organization. And we went through the survey results with respect to what um, you as members thought that the network would be most useful for, and we'll kind of re-talk about that a bit today. And go to the next slide. So just to ground ourselves very briefly, there are four pillars of the purpose of us all signing on today. After a lot of discussion over the last year, the four key areas that people thought would be most useful for a provincial group like this is to really help improve our understanding and sharing of best practices, policies, models of care, not to reinvent the wheel and not to require a formal study every time we want to uh, just get some information from other programs. We um, wanted to be able to coordinate linkages to national organizations that are doing very, we are all doing very similar work and to make sure we make the best use of what we're doing and disseminate and, and um, use knowledge generation and translation principles for that to really have a national framework to be able to do that and then hopefully to be able to define a common set of outcome measures for CKD clinic care. And so since the last meeting in July, we did put a call out for a steering committee membership. And as per the terms of reference, we wanted to include many people on this wheel. And so before I introduce who, who the people are, next slide, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some evolution of the government structure of this committee. So this was traditionally what we had in the terms of reference, that we would have all of us as the interprovincial CKD committee that would report out to an executive that had all the members on the wheel. We were very fortunate to have everybody um, say they wanted to be part of it. So we actually have leads from all these organizations joining. And then we realized how unruly that would be um, if we kept that structure. So Graham, if you want to press. So what we thought is uh, at the bottom and at the core are the network members, which are all of you on the call. And then we would get advice from the steering committee. But really, there would have to be a core team um, of a few of us that really would be accountable to our both our funding and our national bodies to make sure that we're all on task and to keep things going. So if there's no um, differing opinions, we will structure it a bit this way just so we don't have committees of 100 reporting to committees of 30 and, uh, and n no accountability. So the core team, um, I guess I should introduce myself at the beginning, but next slide. 
the core team that will assume um, some of this accountability going forward are myself. I'm, my name is Monica. I'm a nephrologist and, um, in Vancouver and work a lot with the BC Provincial Initiative. And then maybe if Stephanie, are you able to just introduce yourself? Why don't we start with Scott while Stephanie's getting ready? Hi, it's Scott Brimble here, I'm a nephrologist in Hamilton, and I also, similar to Monica, uh, lead some work in the sort of CKD sphere in Ontario with the Ontario Research Network. And Selena? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a uh, knowledge translation worker for um, um, chronic disease, uh, specifically focusing on kidney disease, and um, I'm happy to be on the team. And I'm from Cal. And Stephanie's traveling. Hi, I'm I'm here. I'm on I'm on the line. I've been having issues with my communication. So my name is Stephanie Wynn. I'm a regional. I'm a nephrology director at a program in Sudbury, Ontario, and I also work uh, with Scott at the Ontario Renal Network and support some of the regional programs in uh, in Northern Ontario. I've, uh, I've I'm a nurse by background and I've worked in nephrology for about 17 years in a in a variety of roles and uh, this director role is the most recent. And we have made sure that we do have both a physician and an administrative co-lead just to make sure we have broad-based representation and um, hopefully this will allow us to reach out if possible. And then in terms of the steering committee, next slide. I won't go through the bios of all of these individuals, but we'll make sure to post the bios for you and many are on the call. But just to um, point out, we do have representation, um, Elizabeth, in terms of the um, dietitians, Braden and Adira, who do not need introduction, but in terms of CanSolve, CanNet, and also clinicians that work in CKD programs, uh, Heather Harris from CanSolve. We have Mila as well. Next slide. Janet Graham from Canna. We can go to the next slide. My slide is stuck. Are others stuck as well? Wonderful. So Mila, Janet from Canna, and we're very, very fortunate to have two um, patient partners, both Mary and Kate, have uh, agreed to join and provide their insight and help us with this as well as on the next slide, um, Judith Marin from the Pharm National Pharmacy Association, Dr. Zimmerman, who is the incoming president of CSN, Elizabeth Miles, who's the executive director of KFOC, Kidney Foundation, and uh, Lydia, who is the national director of programs and policy from Kidney Foundation, as well as, I'm not sure why he gets in a, his own page except for formatting, but Neil <laughs> from the social work group. And we have a, so on the next slide, you'll see that we have broad-based representation. And what we've asked these people to do, um, they're gonna take a three-year term, and their functions really are in the bullets, Graham, if you press forward. They will help us determine the strategic direction of this network. They'll help us um, provide some direction to the working groups. And I think the most important thing is that we can feed out to these individuals who have a national representation in their own respective uh, programs. And we can also leverage things that they are doing um, with their own programs to feed in to help disseminate through this national network. So I hope this will definitely have broad-based representation and also help um, prevent us recreating things that we could, we could do together. We do have three um, ghosts <laughs> that we are just waiting for confirmation on from Pediatric Nephrology um, Clinical Trials Network and Kent, and those will be forthcoming shortly. Next slide. So we did get input from a variety of team members with respect to um, what this initiative and this network should do as first priorities. And I just want to orient those that um, haven't been on these calls before on the next slide to remind you 
that we know now, which actually took a while getting this information, who who practices in kidney care clinics in Canada. So we have quite a robust um, list, uh, network of those kidney clinics. There are at least 80, and many of those clinics do report to provincial renal programs as outlined in this bubble. Um, for example, in BC, there are 14 clinics that report into the provincial clinic. Um, in other structures, it works similar or not, but we do have a good idea of the reporting structures so far for the CKD clinics, and this national network is absolutely not to change any of that, but to help learn from best practices in other areas. And the next slide. So we have had over 200 members sign up, um, which I find quite remarkable and probably showing the, the need for something like this. We have um, 60, 66, I think, physicians that have uh, signed up as part of the network and 103 um, interprofessional team members, researchers, coordinators. So we already do have quite a robust uh, network. And on the next slide, when we did our survey, we found there was substantial variation across programs at, with some of the items on the bullets um, on your slides. And the goal is not to standardize all clinics to be cookie cutters of each other, but hopefully to provide a forum for discussion. So on the next slide, in terms of the network priorities and where we want to go, um, this is the rank list of the network priorities that the members that have um, weighed in so far have told us are of importance. And the most important is, I guess, what we're starting to do today is that network for peers and colleagues to share best practices and how we do that will probably evolve. There was um, important set to a national document outlining models of care to common sets of education and tools and resources to a common set of quality measures, um, which was actually put forth on order of priority, maybe in order of priority or maybe in order of what, how we should go along biting these off. So we'll talk a bit at the end of when we set up working groups with respect to um, what we're going to tackle first and get your input on that. And one new item came up, um, and, the, and just be... For that slide, one new item came up when we talked with the advisory um, council, and they were quite helpful, saying maybe we should try something that we can um, kind of bite off and get some traction and, and get some output. And what came up was whether we set up a working group or whether we set up through the core um, renal rounds, you know, goal four or five renal rounds in the year where we provide high-impact topics that... Um, leaders in the field will provide to the interprofessional teams that we can just all sign on in a lunch and learn webinar format and try to expand our knowledge um, with respect to CKD CARES curriculum. So no, no um, formal administrative discussions, just learning and some good time at the end for discussion. So that was a new um, priority area that was um, proposed and something I think will be quite um, easy to do and quite valuable going forward. So we'll incorporate that as well. And then in terms of, on the next slide, in terms of what those topics uh, would be that we would talk about, these were the um, areas of, of most kind of discussion and dialogue between the team members that they would like a national um, forum to discuss, uh, the conservative care pathways that many um, provinces are starting to formalize, and our approach to conservative care patients, the use of the kidney failure risk equation in CKD care, the roles of the different team members in clinic, criteria for clinic enrollment, staffing models and funding. Some of these might lend well to working groups. Some of them might lend well to the uh, renal rounds. So when we looked around and saw um, kind of what was being done and what we could present to this group, um, as a start, and what's going on provincially with respect, or sorry, nationally with respect to this, um, we, uh, Calgary um, recommended um, Mo Donald, and I have met Mo only virtually, but what I understand is she's working on a cancel CKD project on self-care of patients in early, like earlier stage chronic kidney disease. And I was interested to read that, Mo, you're a practicing physiotherapist. All right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Who is working at the University of Cal 
Calgary is a senior research associate and is a PhD candidate uh, focusing on patient-centered care. So we thought this would be a, a good first discussion to have Mo present what she has found so far nationally with respect to self-care in CKD. Mo, are you okay if I pass it over to you? You bet. And uh, okay. Greg, I'll have, you, uh, I'll have you forward the slide, please. Thanks. So basically, um, this project, as Monica mentioned, is uh, one of the Council of CKD Network projects um, led by uh, Brenda and colleagues. And the project aim overall over the next few years is to look at developing a CKD patient self-management uh, intervention that can be individualized to patients' unique situation, needs, and priorities. Um, and this came up from a study that was done uh, a few years ago, which was a prioritization study using the James Lind Alliance methodology. And one of the top ten priorities was to look at uh, self-management strategies for the CKD population. Next slide. So I just wanted to give you an overview of the, the project itself. We have broken it down into a few phases. I have shown here on um, that uh, we have three phases illustrated here for now, and uh, it will continue on past phase three. But in phase one is to identify and synthesize the literature and current practices. So in order to um, achieve that goal, we have done uh, completed a scoping review and an environmental scan. In the second phase, which is happening right now, is uh, we wanted to assess and prioritize the needs of adults with CKD um, and their family members. And so we're presently doing focus groups and phone interviews across Canada. And then when that is completed, the, the data from that will inform a one-day consensus conference using a nominal group technique to try to prioritize what are those areas of self-management important to patients, but also present that at a consensus um, meeting so that other stakeholders, um, such as uh, the clinicians, nephrologists, decision makers um, can also be part of the discussion with patients and their caregivers. And then the third phase is to co-design and pilot test, implement and evaluate um, what this self-management intervention will be. We don't know what that's going to look like because phase one and phase two will inform that. But the idea is to be novel about designing this tool that is accessible to everyone and has the component, the needs or uh, components based on the needs of patients and their caregivers. So what I wanted to focus on today was more of the phase one in our findings, specifically the environmental scan. Next slide. So basically, um, what we have found is, and then next slide, is, um, and I think Selena um, sent this out to um, key contacts a few months ago regarding the summary review of the environmental scan. And the environmental scan was an online survey that we requested clinic leads or their appropriate staff to fill out at the CKD clinics. And we were asking a key question, which was, can you tell us about um, your top three or your most common three self-management interventions or strategies or resources you use? in your clinic. So we sent that out to um, 50, I think it was 77 clinics, and we got a, a, no, no, I think it was like 60 some clinics, and we got a 77% response rate, um, which is great. So I'd like to thank those uh, that completed that survey that um, was helpful, um, and we found interesting things. Next slide. So basically, just uh, going through a few highlights of this survey, and, and just keep in mind, we, we were asking for common resources or interventions, but we weren't comparing clinics or what they were using um, and in a comparison. We just wanted to basically do counts of what is out there to describe what is out there. So when you look at this slide, we're looking at the number of um, CKD clinics using similar resources, and it was mentioned earlier um, in the presentation by Monica is, a lot of clinics are using similar resources in their clinics. So as you can see, um, you can see um, living with kidney disease manual is um, used by the majority of uh, clinics. 
And when we um, surveyed the clinics, we found that there was a total of 131 different resources, or uh, 131 resources there from the clinics, but there were 19 duplicate resources. Um, and so some of those, as you can see here, would have been the KFOC, uh, living well, living with kidney disease, um, faster patient first booklets we used in nine clinics. And so when we removed the duplicates, we found that there's 112 different distinct resources that clinics are using across Canada. Next slide. So when we look at um, the self-management topics that are being provided within these resources at the clinics across Canada, the most common self-management resource topic was modalities, which um, obviously probably makes sense to most of you on the line in terms of the population you are seeing at CKD clinics or multidisciplinary clinics that this would be an appropriate topic to present um, to your clients. Um, the second most common was in that category of other. And that was like a mixed bag of things such as smoking cessation, weight management, patient diaries, and sick day management information. Then followed by nutrition and comorbidities and then general CKD knowledge, et cetera. Next slide. So when we look at then how are those resources delivered, um, what format, out of the 131 resources, 64% were provided in a combination. And when we talk about combination, that looks more like print and face-to-face -face and electronic and also by phone or email communication. But when we separated out all those resources and just kind of categorized them into these bins here, print was the most common provided um, net mode of um, delivery followed by face-to-face, -face, which would make sense, and then electronic, followed by telephone and mail, and then non-response. Next slide. So who is providing those resources in the clinic? So 50% um, of the total number of resources were provided by more than one provider, which makes sense if you have uh, a multidisciplinary team um, intervening um, with self-management. And uh, basically, though, when we separated out uh, how the resources were, who the resources were provided for, it was 92% by nurses, then followed by dietitians. And you'll see the breakdown for social worker, nephrologist, et cetera. Next slide. So what is the so what behind this? So as I mentioned, we just wanted to find out what's happening on the ground. We did the scoping review, which was also that phase one, to look at what was um, in the literature um, and what was being studied in terms of management intervention. Then we wanted to see what was on the ground. And this was driven by our patient partners saying, you know, it's great to see what's in the literature, but what does that relate to what we really get in reality across Canada? So again, this was just a descriptive study to highlight the current resources or the top three that have been decided by the clinics across Canada. Um, this combined with our literature review and then looking at our phase two, identifying the needs and preferences for self-management interventions with patients and caregivers will help us work towards that phase two to design a novel tool. Um, and so basically that uh, one of the key things is that we noticed that overall, which matched the scoping review, is a lot of the information that's either being tested um, or presented to patients is near the end stage, um, or is for end stage. And what we're hearing from patients is, I need more information in the earliest stages, and how do we capture that, and who provides that? Because uh, a lot of those patients, as you know, are in primary care. Um, so those, that's one of the gaps um, that we're trying to um, fill with this work moving forward and being led with our patient partners. So next slide. So I um, just put up my contact information there. And so basically, if you have any questions now for me to answer um, or you want to get involved in our project we're going for, um, I know that this would be a great, um, a great uh, initiative to work with uh, the network um, regarding this self-management uh, tool and intervention for the future. Thanks. Thank you, Mo. That was excellent. I, I was very... Um, I guess not surprised, but it was interesting to see how there was only 2% of the, um, the information on symptom management, which is quite and interesting when you actually look at that slide. And that's um, interesting, an interesting point because that's what's been brought up by our patient partners and just anecdotally, um, and as I'm doing these interviews and focus groups across Canada, that's been a common topic that has come up.
Absolutely. Any questions? Any questions or comments from those on the line? I guess the, the question will be how, how to be involved as a network and if there's anything you would need from the network. Um, I would say that we would love to kind of have a standing item to get updates on this initiative or if there's anything that you wanted feedback through when, once the meetings are set up, feedback through this venue, um, please feel free to keep or please keep us in the, in the loop. and. Um, and I'm sure any member on the call would be happy to give feedback. So just that forum to, to get that feedback or focus group participants or whatever is needed. That's great. Yeah, that would be appreciated. And uh, again, feel free to contact me um, if you have any questions offline or need more details. Um, we do have uh, the manuscripts um, both for the scoping review um, in submission and uh, um, findings from the CKD clinic survey. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, we did have uh, one question come through from uh, Braden. Uh, Mo, he's just asking, um, do you have a sense of the quality of the current tools and how we might be able to assess that? Yeah, great question, uh, Braden. So in terms of the, um, if we look at the scoping review, obviously it was a scoping review, so we didn't look at um, the quality of the evidence, but we did capture if there was changes in different factors that they that each of the primary studies were looking at. So if there was if there was an improvement in say physiological outcomes versus behavioral outcomes versus um, other outcomes that would be measured by those primary studies. So we do have that, but obviously it's not um, grading the quality. We just Reporting if it's improved, not improved, um, no change, or and no change. In terms of the survey, um, we don't have um, the quality assessed on in terms of the tools that have been provided. But um, thanks to the people that did complete the survey, they did provide us with all the like, either hard copies or electronic copies of um, what they're using. So I have a box of these uh, these materials in my office. So. Um, Possibly a next step is that we can start looking at what, what we do have mm -hmm. and see, you know, how does that match up to some of the findings um, that have been presented in the literature in terms of being like successful in changing either some of those outcomes. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. If if anyone else wants to ask a question via the chat function or the question function, please feel free to do so. We've had another one here asking, uh, is there a way to access the resources that other CKD clinics are using? Good question. Uh, I'm not too sure. Maybe I'll hand that over to Selena. Um, like I said, I have a box of stuff, but um, <laughs> nobody wants me to pass that box around as a show and tell. So we could, um, yeah, maybe we could just do categorize a table, um, put together a table, like a list of both the electronic and the uh, like hard copies and the way, where they came from. So then maybe, I don't know, people feel open then to contacting people that have provided those resources to us. Do you sure what the best is and if the network has them, any ideas? Yeah, I think that's still one of, our, um, one of our big questions is where we definitely will need somewhere to house these and where, but I think we might be able to, um, Selena, any ideas off the top of your head of, of easy solutions while we're waiting to have well, a website the, or? Sure. Like one of the things we could do is um, perhaps um, in a similar format that Mo suggested is where these tools are available. So categorizing the different tools, um, which clinics are using them or which renal program they're associated with, um, and then where if they're easily accessible online. One of the things we could probably talk about later on in this presentation, um, when we get to the next part, we want to look at possibly striking a working group that could look at um, a, a, the, uh, the topic of how we can uh, we can identify some of these top resources, perhaps in um, you know in advanced uh, CKD, but also be able to capture the really good resources that are currently being used in early CKD. So one of the things we could do. Um, uh, the website, having a website would be uh, a quick solution and that's uh, something we've considered. Uh, the other thing would be is to compile it all together into a document and share that 
through the network. Um, you know, uh, very similar who's possibly putting together information uh, through a newsletter, uh, but definitely housing it as one sort of a PDF. Hi, it's Ken here. Um, I'm, I'm the security unit manager here in Calgary. I'm sitting here with Selena and Mo. Um, just recently, actually, Mo provided me a list of um, of the online resources that are used across Canada by the CQD clinics, and she only provided me that just because I was asking uh, for some information in regards to that. So I'm thinking what Selena suggested in terms of, uh, you know, using the the network as a as a forum to share that. I mean, I think we have to find some other ways in terms for the hard copies. Uh, from other clinic resources, but however, there's a huge list that uh, Mo has compiled, and I found that really helpful. And I would suggest that that be sent out actually to all the members in the in the network, and because we have frontline uh, staff participating in this network as well, and uh, you know we can also go back to the individual CKD clinics who are interested in reviewing those online resources and how we can uh, maybe put that into um, uh, use in our specific clinic. So um, I, I guess for me, I would ask that if Mo can share that widely. Uh, with all the staff, uh, with all the, you know, through the network, and we can have access to that. I think that would be a good start. And um, yeah, for sure, that um, that's a great place to start. And I think I'll add to that. Like I think what we can do is um, look at um, placing all those the resources and please categorizing them by their title, um, who provided them, you know, how they're being used, just based on the way um, their response to the survey questions were. So the who, what, how kind of thing. Um, we have left the how, different, but uh, you know, at least it's a starting place. And then I think with the um, with the patient partners within the network, it might be handy for them to have some input into what they think of these resources as they stand now, because that will help us going forward for what we need to work on when, um, with our tool development. And I think this is a good segue to the next part where we actually need some involvement and some uh, volunteers. And so Stephanie was going to talk about the next, uh, the first working group, and I think it's very, very relevant actually. Um, the only thing I was going to say about the list is just to keep it in real time. I know many of us keep some of our tools on websites, so whenever it is easily found in an electronic format, um, some links or URLs to those um, documents would be probably most helpful to keep things current, but I agree with everything that's been said. So, Stephanie, are you able to? Uh, sure. Can you hear me? Group? Yep. Can you get? Okay. Okay, so I think, uh, you know, the conversation we've just been having and uh, Mo's presentation is a good segue into looking at what we would propose uh, this working group once it's developed, to look at would be um, educational tools for patients with advanced CKD. So if you look on slide 32, um, the initial network priorities that were identified and, and talked about earlier in the slide deck, um, this would address uh, priority number three, which would be a common set of standardized patient education tools and resources. Uh, and again, that, that survey was done uh, this past summer. So in addition to that, there's some other topics that were outlined uh, of interest, like conservative care pathways and management, the use of the kidney failure risk equation in, in kidney care. Um, and we would really want your input today on if we can decide as a network if this should be uh, the first uh, work that we take on to, to build um, a resource pool of, of uh, the best educational tools and resources for patients with advanced CKD. And really what, what should we include in this in terms of modality education, um, you know, nutritional information, information on transplants or any other types of modalities. So we really want to open it up to you today to talk about that and get your thoughts if, if we can be in agreement that that would be a good uh, starting point for this network. Maybe, maybe we'll open up right now for just some comments. If anybody has any comments or uh, questions or ideas, if that would work. So I'll take that as a as a, a big hooray. Let's move forward on that one. That's right. <laughs> All right, perfect. Endorsement. And if anyone just wants to volunteer right off, then, uh, then yeah. please do as well. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, oh sorry. It's uh, Russell and Mary. Uh, we think that's an excellent idea, doing the, the, the tools, educated tools for patients with advanced CKD. 
Yeah, hi, it's uh, Kristen from North Bay, and um, I'd be willing to help out as well because I've heard the same thing uh, from um, staff that they would um, appreciate that kind of um, resources. Hi, it's Cheryl from Nova Scotia. I think we would be interested in participating as well. Hi, it's Marnie from Aurelia in Ontario, and uh, our, our Regional Renal Patient and Family Advisory Council has recently undertaken um, uh, a project at looking at all of the um, education tools and resources that are available to patients across our multi-care kidney clinics and, and at six sites and are working to standardize those here locally, so it would be great to tie that work into this national work as well. Hi, it's Patty from Humber Hospital in Toronto. I'm a body access coordinator. I would also like to participate. Hi, it's Bea from the Kidney Foundation. I'd also like to participate. Hi, it's Elizabeth Zabajski from um, Canadian Association of Nephrology Dietitians. I'd like to participate. And there's a number of uh, nephrology dietitians across Canada that have responded to me, and I think they would be willing to share their resources, and we have a lot of them across Canada, so standardizing them would be ideal. Hi, it's Lisa and Jennifer from Calgary, and uh, we would like to participate. Hi, it's Mary Bocas from North Bay. I'm a patient partner with Camp Health CKD. I'd be willing to participate as well. It's Sandy Vanderzee from the Northern Alberta Renal Program in Alberta, and I'm sure that our team would be happy to participate as well and join the group. Hi, it's, hello? Yes. Hello. Hi, it's Judith from uh, the Renal Pharmacist Network. Our network would really also like to participate to this initiative. So that's great. It looks like we have, um, our, our priorities are still in line with what we heard back in the summer. And I guess, Selena, would you be sort of the gatekeeper for anyone who's interested in contacting and participating in this working group? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I feel we put everybody on the spot. So by all means, once we are, we'll, we'll uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we will send you the link. Um, you know, feel free to share it also with your colleagues. Um, the other thing which, uh, you know, um, as we were discussing um, as a core team a few months ago was often um, in the development of these educational resources, um, of course, the frontline staff, the nurses, the allied healthcare professionals that are involved in the delivery of the, of the uh, tools are very important in the development, but often they are individuals, uh, like designers or uh, you know, like app producers or communicators who you may have uh, been in contact with as you were developing resources or considering developing resources for your specific clinics. So, you know, individuals like that would also be quite helpful and, uh, you know, may come with a very unique perspective as we start looking at, um, you know, um, categorizing and uh, deciding on where we're going to house these tools or if they need to be modified, right? So just something to consider as well. And I think too, uh, I think it was Marnie had mentioned that this is some of the work is being vetted through their patient and family advisory councils. And I think that also gives us a really good uh, indicator of what's important to patients. And I'm, I'm, I can't recall if we have anyone as a patient representative sitting uh, as a part of the greater council, but perhaps we would want to consider uh, a patient rep as well in our working group. I think we have already some people signed up. Yeah. Perfect. I think Mary Bugaj is Mary, also yeah. involved. So. It's Braden. I, I'm not keen to participate um, unless <laughs> I need to, but I think you'll want to give some consideration up front to when we've worked with education specialists in the past, they tell us that some patients want to watch a video, others want to work through a decision aid, others want handouts, and so it would be really helpful, I think, if you can create some structure around all these tools and maybe categorize them by the type of tool, and then you'll have to think a lot about whether they're appropriate for Canadian patients, and um, I don't know how to measure quality, and we don't want to 
Um, but I know that we have some tools that are quite old and probably aren't appropriate anymore, so you'll have to think about which ones you want to sort of offer to clinics, and then obviously it's up to clinics to decide which ones they potentially want to use. They probably don't want to offer 15 for their patients, so we'll just need to think of all those steps. Yeah, absolutely. Those will be, so we will, um, we will task the working group. We will um, get back to people with the membership of the working group and reporting in, and um, hopefully we'll have something over the next few months that we can discuss. Um, Stephanie, anything else about the, I think it was a very successful membership drive <laughs> the working group. I think so too. Um, and just some things to consider, and, and you know, we'll be communicating about this, but, you know, what are the sort of things that we want to achieve as this working group? You know, obviously we have a lot of participation and people who are interested, but we'll have to look at, you know, who's going to lead this work and, and when we want it delivered by and by when and to whom. And sort of what supports as this network, uh, what we would need to be successful and to get this work done. So just some key, uh, key themes to think about moving forward. Absolutely. So I think that is the end of our formal, um, of our slides. Um, thank you so much for everyone's participation. We propose that we try to have at least, um, at least three, but hopefully four meetings a year of this group to be not too onerous, but um, I'll make sure we maintain some momentum. We have um, picked the this time slot just because nothing's going to work for everybody, but it seems to work for most, and whether we're going to have to stagger it in the future to make sure we get all representation, we will uh, figure that out as we go. The dates that we um, are proposing, we have one in June 7th, September 20th, I think, and December 6th of 2018. Um, at this time, and we're still working on a March date, if that's at all possible, with all the various spring breaks and timing of that. And then we have not finalized yet, but we hope to be able to have um, some sort of um, presence at, at the CSN, which is in Vancouver in May, to help forward this work. So we will get back to you on that. Before we close, any um, last minute questions, comments, ideas? that you want us to consider going forward, either um, speak now or chat now, and we will relay those. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, is there are there minutes available for the first meeting that held as well as this one? Uh, this is Selena. So for the first uh, the first webinar, because we were we recorded the webinar, uh, we didn't take formal minutes per se. I do have. What I've captured are like some key discussion points, so I'm happy to circulate the rest, sort of more for internal purposes. But I'm I'm happy to circulate those. Okay, great, thank you. And just as an idea, feeding from that, if any of you in your organizations do have, you know, operations meetings in your kidney care clinics or others that you want to um, add the national CKD initiative as we get going, both for reporting out and for input to us, um, feel free to do so and be happy to take any of those uh, any of those ideas and inputs.